The Albert Gen Q Season 3, just around the corner, I thought some of you might like a quick and dirty recap of Season 1 and 2 to catch you up on all the drama so it's fresh for November 18th. Since I'm trying to cover two seasons in one video, I'm going to try recapping it in a slightly different way, taking it character by character. Let me know if this works for you. Am I biting off more than I can chew? <laughs> Let's find out. So, what happened in Season 1? Let's kick start things by establishing who is who. We are thrown right into the middle of an all-out schmixy scene as a way to introduce this reboot, and that is how we meet Sophie and Danny, clearly an established couple, so much so Danny proposes later in the episode, and it's a yes. We then meet the charming Messy Finley, who is sneaking out after her own schmixy time, and Micah, a trans man who Finley seems to think should go out with that new property manager, Jose. Cut to our returning faves. Bet, who is running for office as the first openly gay candidate, and Angie, her daughter who is now 16 and cutting class to go vape with her bestie Geordie, who she's crushing on. Alice is living with her girlfriend, Natalie, and her two kids, and looking a bit out of her comfort zone with the whole child thing. So let's Gigi, Natalie's ex, take them to school. Shane is disembarking from a private jet, having just separated from her famous singer wife Kiara, and has decided to move back to LA, and although she's right back to her old Shane ways, we'll shortly find out that she's actually pretty destroyed by this. We've also got Tess, who will be the manager of the bar that Shane will eventually buy. Sophie and Finley work for Alice, who is on the second season of her talk show, which is where Shane turns up, and it's cute vibes all around as they squee at seeing each other again. And then go to lunch with Bet, and there's something just so comforting about finding these lovely ladies again after so long, even if I do feel like I'm a wasteland of unrealized potential compared to these ridiculously competent women. Alright, let's see how the rest of the season went for each character. Bet meets Danny, who works for her dad's investment company. They possibly want to donate to her campaign, but the meeting tanks because the money is coming from Big Pharma investments, which Bet, in a baller move, refuses to align herself with. How the hell do you sleep at night? This hits Danny hard. When Bet is outed for having an affair with a married woman and goes on Alice's show to confront it head on, Danny is so impressed she asks to work for Bet. I think you need me. Damn, that's confidence. Throughout the rest of the season, Bet works the campaign with erudite poise. She holds her own in a debate with Deputy Mayor Jeff Milner and appears to resonate with voters. But Danny catches her with Felicity, the woman she had the affair with. You can be with her, or you can stay in this race and fight for what you believe in, but you can't have it both ways. Bet knows Danny is right, so she breaks it off. Crisis averted? This is the L word. It goes public. Bet is about to quit the race when dun dun dun, Tina is back. Angie called her to come. She's been out of town for her job, which is why Bet's been the primary caregiver. We get a bit of backstory, and by backstory I mean a vague few sentences about why Tina and Bet aren't together anymore. And I felt like half of a person. But it's clear that Bet is not over her. Tell me how long it took for you to feel normal after Tina. Well, you're assuming that I feel normal now. You don't? No. Which is why she just loves the announcement that Tina is engaged to Kerry and moving in down the street. As for the campaign, Danny convinces her to reveal to the voters why she's running, in memory of Kit, her sister who died from a heroin overdose. And while the election is nose to nose, Bet ultimately loses. Touching on Angie, she seems like a cool kid. She clearly has a close relationship with Tina and a cool relationship with Shane and Alice, which we get to see when Angie asks for love and sex advice from Shane and Alice. Shane with her ex-wife, which I'll chat about later, are even there for Angie's first kiss, which is kind of sweet. The fact that Angie was insanely embarrassed makes her a far more mature person than she has reason to be. Well, I guess she did punch a girl in the face for being an asshat about her mum. It's clear she'd love for Bet and Tina to get back together, which is why she's bummed to hear that Tina is marrying Kerry. Meanwhile, Alice is getting her hand slapped for going rogue by having Bet on her show. The execs assign a dude called Drew to keep Alice in line despite the interview going really well. Yeah, that guy's a real bag of dicks. Mm -hmm. Alice is having Jeff Milner, the candidate, running against Bet on her show, and Drew, the dude, is trying to guide her towards stupid and inane questions rather than asking the real stuff. And I know you want to do your feminism. Oh, hell. Stop it. 
Alice goes for it and slays. That doesn't mean her show is safe. She's basically told she needs a viral hit in order to get views and secure a season three. Alice decides to keep her integrity and do her own thing. In her personal life, Alice is playing matchmaker between girlfriend Natalie and ex-wife Gigi when Natalie reveals she has no friends post-divorce. Things get a little spicy, however, when at Shane's 40th bash, they have a threesome which starts a little thruple situation between them. Alice is kinda down for it, and it's cute them all hanging out and trying to negotiate what that might look like. So I'm bummed when Alice realizes that thrupling isn't for her because she's too jealous. I don't think this is what I meant. Alice breaks things off. Best storyline dropped, if you ask me. Honestly, I think this could have been a banger of a storyline if they'd gone with it. The season ends with Natalie showing up to Alice's final show of the season to interrupt and beg Alice to come back to her. I mean, she's the fucking best. I'm pretty great. <laughs> this magically provides the viral hit the show needs, but I can't begrudge Alice that moment of being wooed. After getting served divorce papers, Shane decides she needs a drink, which she gets, along with a bar. Anything to distract herself, I guess. She calls it Dana's, and I'm just a little sucker for these kinds of OG callbacks. She asks the lesbian couple, one of whom is Tess, managing the place to stay on, and despite sleeping with Tess's girlfriend, Tess forgives her. The night of Shane's 40th, she gets high with Bet, reveals that she and her wife, Kiara, broke up because she doesn't want kids, and signs the papers. <laughs> I got divorced on my birthday. But then ex-wife turns up, pregnant. Shane still loves Kiara, but, you know, she doesn't want kids. I'm not asking you to be a parent. I'm not sure how that is supposed to work. Wanting to be with Kiara, she tells her she's in, but she's struggling to feel invested. Kiara loses the baby. I lost a baby and you were relieved. No, 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 no. And it's clear that as much as Shane wants to want kids, she really doesn't. Maiko gets a date with the new building manager, Jose, which goes well. Or at least things seem to be going well until Jose blows Maiko off for unknown reasons. There's some hot and cold messaging going on, but Mike is into him, so forgives him. He's even introducing this new squeeze to his mum, and she's supportive, which is cute. Then Micah finds out that Jose is in fact married when he bumps into the husband at an art exhibition. Rounding back to Danny, she tells Sophie she got a new job with Bet, but Sophie's not all that happy about it. Okay, it smells like stress sweat in here, is it me? Yep, it sure does. Danny's dad doesn't take her quitting or getting engaged all that well. He thinks that Sophie's not good enough for Danny, although he does extend an olive branch and says he'll pay for a very fancy wedding venue, but basically takes over. So if everything's already set, when is our wedding? The breaking point between them comes when he sends her a prenup for her and Sophie to sign. When Sophie tries to talk with Danny about it, Danny shuts down. All the little cracks that have been fracturing their relationship come to a head when Sophie's grandma winds up in hospital and it's Finley, and not Danny, who is there for her. Which is saying something because Finley is a mess. She only sleeps with women when she's drunk and when she finds out her latest squeeze Rebecca is a minister to an LGBTQ church, she freaks out because she and God have a rough history. I was raised Catholic. Very, very Catholic. Which is probably why she drinks so much and has never had a relationship. It brings up trauma for her. But she's also an adorable, unruly puppy and I can't help but warm to her even if she puts her foot squarely in her mouth. Because you're not a real priest. It's not a real church. Effectively ending the relationship. Tessa was going through her own thing because Shane hooked up with her girlfriend, commiserates with Finley by getting plastered and they sleep together. You're a mess. <laughs> oh yes, we'll discover just how much of a mess next season. But first, the slow train wreck between Finley and Sophie. They go out drinking, get pretty friendly, and dance to Tegan and Sarah's song Closer. And by the way, you should go watch the series High School based on their life as teens on Amazon. They then pass out in each other's arms. Where could this be heading? Who knows? When Danny isn't there for Sophie with her grandma in hospital and Finley is, they end up kissing. Sophie feels guilty but says that'll never happen again. <laughs> so doesn't tell Danny. But obviously doesn't feel guilty enough to then not sleep with Finley. Yikes. With Danny jobless, after Bet losing the election, she wants to elope to Hawaii. Finley is flying home. Who is Sophie going to meet? Okay, on to season two. Bet has left her political career behind and is headhunted by the biggest art house in the world. 
The owner wants more BIPOC people on his roster because they're a hot commodity, and with his kind of money and influence, she knows she can do more for BIPOC artists and her social justice causes than independently. So she takes his offer. Yes. Even if she second guesses it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm cut out for selling my soul. While at an art exhibition, she bursts into tears because she comes across a piece of work she knows is by Pippa Pascal, an artist whose work is the reason why she got into art in the first place. Pippa had disappeared after speaking out about racism in the art world. Meanwhile, Kerry, Tina's fiance, is getting right under her skin. This just highlights the fact that I'm alone. I mean, Tina has Carrie, and she makes her laugh. She's all jokey, and I have, oh yeah, that's right, I have no one. I'm going to die alone. I doubt it, but I get the sentiment. Alice suggests a blind date with Gigi because Gigi has been making herself unwanted. What do you want? To get back together. (laughs) Bet and Gigi date for a hot second, mostly to make Tina jealous, but Bet doesn't treat Gigi all that well, so them breaking up is a foregone conclusion. Bet's far more interested in tracking down Pippa Pascal. The reception is more than a little frosty, but Bet is Bet and she persists. Please, don't touch me like this, unless you're coming home with me. Despite reservations at stepping back into the art world, Bet woos Pippa with an exhibition at the CAC Museum as part of a showcase of Black Lives Matter. Things also turn romantic, but there's quickly trouble in paradise because of a surprise Danny arranged, which I'll discuss when we get to her section. Bet's passion for Pippa's work brings them back together, and this moment... Okay. It's okay, I got you. There was something just so lovely about it, and I honestly really like Bet and Pippa together, but Pippa is a smart lady. She clocks that Bet is hung up on Tina, just as Kerry has clocked it too. In fact, Kerry, after trying to connect with Bet, is beginning to question if she can even marry Tina anymore, given the hostilities, and it culminates in her breaking the engagement off. Just as Bet is about to go to Pippa on the opening night of the CAC Museum exhibition, she opens the door and bam, there is Tina on her doorstep once more. While all of this is going on for Bet, Angie declares she wants to meet her donor, but Bet and Tina promised to keep him anonymous until Angie was 18, so she needs to wait another year. Carrie sticks her nose in by suggesting a DNA test, which she does against her mum's wishes. She finds out that she has a half-sister. Bet is angry about it, but takes her to meet her sister with Alice and Shane in tow in a totally cute and supportive move, and then they conspicuously sit outside the cafe and watch from afar. A++ family vibes. Her sister tells her that her dad, Angie's donor, is terminally ill. Angie declares she wants to see if she's a kidney match in a counselling session moderated by Micah. Bet and Tina don't want Angie to do it, and the tension between Bet and Kerry boil over into outright hostility when Kerry pipes up. Angie arranges to meet her donor and prepares by writing a list of questions. At the last minute, he refuses to see her because he's not doing well. Unsurprisingly, Angie is not in the mood for a prom, which is all Geordie has seemed to care about despite Angie going through things. It looks like the night is ruined when she and Geordie fight, but Alice and Shane step in to convince her to reconcile with her girlfriend. Bet and Tina recognise how important her donor is for Angie, so they go back to the hospital and get the questions to him and the promise of a meeting. But he passes away moments later, for which Angie feels guilty. It seems she didn't go through with the kidney matching after all. The family of her donor, however, all pitch in and answer Angie's questions, giving her a small insight into the man he was. Switching gears, Micah is still seeing Jose despite still being married, and he's promising he'll leave his husband, but surprise, it doesn't happen. Micah confronts Jose and ultimately ends it with him. He starts hanging out with Maribel. She even accompanies him to his new job as counsellor at the same place Natalie works at. It's quickly clear he's ticking the trans diversity box and he's demoralized by it. That's not demoralizing. Yeah, it is. No. A white lady tried to lift me up from my chair today. Wait, what? She thought it would be okay to hold me like a baby. So Mirabel suggests he speaks up, which he does. To thank her for her advice, he arranges a romantic horse riding outing for the two of them and he begins to question if he's not as gay as he thought he was. After moderating the disaster that was Angie's counselling session with Bet, Tina and Kerry, he asks for Maribel to come over and they head to the bedroom. 
They act all weird about it after because I'm not sure why, but ultimately figure out they're both into each other, even if Mirabelle's family doesn't react well. Meanwhile, Shane is invited to join an exclusive poker game that Tess works at, but she accidentally hits on the wife of the woman running the game, so both she and Tess are blacklisted. Tess, I swear to God, I had no idea that was her wife. I know. I swear to you. I know. Trust me. She decides to run her own poker game instead for fun, but also because Shane is a bit financially strapped after her divorce. It seems things are brewing between the ladies, they're hanging out, doing business together, Shane is dropping Tess off at her AA meetings, and they share a kiss. Tess is dealing with her mum in Las Vegas, who has MS, and has to go back a few times to take care of her. On one such trip, Shane shows up and schmixy times afoot. But just as they're getting all loved up, Tess says she needs to move back to Las Vegas permanently to take care of her mum. And while Shane toys with the idea of going with her, she ultimately can't because she's finally got some roots laid down. But they also admit they love each other. So it's not clear what their future with each other is. As for Alice, her show got renewed and it's going well. She's also working on a book that her publisher is keen to get out, but it needs some rewriting, which is how Alice meets Tom. Things in her relationship are, well, not going the greatest because Natalie clearly wants to open up the relationship because she's discovered she's polyamorous and she wants to explore that. Monogamy is not for everyone. Well, it's for most people, except the bad ones. After a chat, Alice gives Natalie the go-ahead and she struggles with understanding it. So when she and Tom go for a work dinner, she chooses the restaurant she knows that Natalie and her new lover will be at and she freaks out. It feels like someone took a, like a rusty knife and they just jabbed it in my heart and they just like slicing it down, oh okay? And then they're just taking my insights and they're just like, oh, She realizes that she can't do this that a relationship with Natalie is over. They finish the rewrite, but declare that they are friends. But in reality, Alice has developed feelings for him. She confesses this to Tom, who is kind of delighted because it's mutual. They sleep together, but then Alice hooks up with Natalie too, which is patently a bad idea, and she realizes this very quickly. Tom's not cool with that at all, but they like each other enough to reconcile. Since they're a couple, it makes things interesting for the press of her new, very queer book. She gets asked about who she's seeing. Who's the lucky lady? Right, lady. Um... Which is awkward, especially as she's been held up as a lesbian icon. Circling back to the cliffhanger of last season, Sophie chose Danny, and they didn't get married in Hawaii. Sophie is feeling guilty and half-heartedly tries to tell Danny about her affair, but ultimately doesn't. And so the wedding is on. When Alice calls Finley to say that they miss her at work, Finley takes it to mean that Sophie is in love with her and turns up at the wedding. Well, no, worse than that, she turns up during the vows to stop the wedding. Oh god, don't do this. Naturally, the wedding is off and we saw it coming a mile away. Danny is pissed, as you would expect. Sophie makes a half-assed attempt to convince Danny to come back to her and Finley... Come on, Finley. Jesus Christ. Oh, she looks like a little kitten on a highway. Oh, oh Finley. Ah, uh, yeah, you kind of deserved that. It's clear Sophie and Finley can't work together, so Finley volunteers to quit and winds up working for Shane, but somehow they end up living together when Finley crashes in the spare room at Micah's invitation, so just sticking herself in there. Sophie tells her to stay. So, yeah. Messy, messy, McMess fest. They seem to be becoming friends when Sophie asks Finley to go out for sushi, but Finley once again takes it 20 steps too far, gets a new blazer, buys flowers, but that's the night that Sophie and Danny hook up for a final time. Things are tense between them as a consequence, and it comes to a head at karaoke night at Shane's club. Sophie sings closer to Finley as an apology, and then it's all on. Well, for about two seconds before Sophie starts to wonder about Finley's direction in life, and then while driving home from one of Shane's fancy soirees, one where Finley said she was fine to drive, they get pulled over, and Finley winds up in jail for being over the limit. This only increases Sophie's concerns, because Finley doesn't seem to want to take accountability for choosing to drive drunk, and when Finley comes home drunk again, they fight, and Finley gets blind drunk and disappears, which gets Sophie so worried she's calling hospitals. Finley shows up at Danny's place, but not before she pees in the hallway, because she's a mess. Sophie, along with the others, try an intervention which doesn't go well, but ultimately Finley agrees to go to rehab. So yeah, Danny is pretty upset about Sophie and Finley. I never want to see you again. 
Needing a place to live on her dad's insistence, she gets an apartment brokered by Gigi, who is a real estate agent. I wouldn't mind such a sweet, sweet pad myself. Gigi and Danny are connecting, and Gigi clearly likes Danny because she offers to show her around the new neighborhood and take her to dinner. Danny confesses things have gotten better with her dad recently, and it's got her suspicious that something is up. Prophetic last words, because that very night she discovers that her dad has been arrested and had snuck in a contract along with the apartment purchase to make her interim CEO of his company in anticipation of this. Danny is there to help Gigi process it, and there's some chemistry going on. Are you hitting on me? Uh, no. Um, yes you are. You are devouring her with your eyes. Gigi officially ends things with Bet and... I told you I'd let you know if my feelings for you changed. And they have. They've changed. While Danny doesn't jump in with both feet at first, they get there. As for Danny's work, she seems to be trying to do good by getting the board of her dad's company to invest in not-for-profits, one of which is a sizable donation to the new wing of the CAC Museum, where Bet has arranged for Pippa's work to be shown. Bet is pissed, and threatens to pull Pippa's work from the show, because this is dirty pharmaceutical money. Gigi's dad is deeply upset because it's a PR nightmare for the company, especially when Bet and Pippa organise a protest. Despite how huge of a donation it was, the CAC ultimately returned the money. Danny's dad is on trial because he's accused of causing the death of half a million people due to pushing a drug when he knew the side effects. Danny is meant to take the stand, but she refuses, which means, just as Danny is meeting Gigi's friends, the police come to arrest her for contempt of court. So the TLDR is... Tina, her engagement with Kerry called off, is at Bet's door, and we know from the trailer she's asking once again if Bet is in love with her. Angie is dating Geordie despite Geordie not being all that supportive of Angie's challenges as she met her sister and tried to meet her donor. Micah and Maribel are a couple, and Micah is not as gay as he thought he was. Shane and Tess got together, they love each other, but their future is unsure because Tess is moving back to Las Vegas to help her mum who is sick. Alice is with Tom, and facing prejudices for being bi and with a man when she's built a brand around being with women. Sophie and Finley got together, but Finley's drinking got in the way, and she is now in rehab. Gigi and Danny got together, but Danny is now arrested for refusing to take the stand at her dad's trial for promoting dangerous pharmaceutical drugs. Hope this helps, and have fun watching season three. Until next time, lady lovers.